Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number six of Chilled and Killed, a true crime podcast where we discuss a crime over a glass of wine or two. We're your hosts, Sam and Amanda, and this week we are discussing a story about a Connecticut man who was convicted of murder, but will soon be released among the free people like you and me. For this week's wine, we chose Taffeta, a fizzy and fun red. good old screw off (laughs) no cork this time oh my god that smells terrible (laughs) oh no (laughs) smells like rotten grapes (laughs) (laughs) the first smell of it was terrible it doesn't smell better now true that's a hefty pour for probably gonna be a nasty wine true we probably should have just tasted it before (laughs) i poured and i poured you you more so much more for me You got me distracted. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, good God. That's funky. I don't know if I I like it. I like the bubbles when you first taste it, but I do not like the flavor that's left in your mouth. It really does taste like a funky bad grape. (laughs) (laughs) It it tastes like chemicals. Um, (laughs) I'm telling you, it's not my favorite. But I would have rather drink this than last week's wine. No, absolutely not. I'll take the Chardonnay any day. I hated that wine. No. That's, this, that I like, was my least favorite wine we've had. Really? Yeah, I was struggling. You saw my face. You were struggling. You were, like, gagging and all, too. Yeah. I yeah, honestly I <laughs> like the first sip of it because of the, like, bubbles that hit your tongue. But after that, I cannot stand the aftertaste. You're going to drink it because I drank some nasty-ass hard shard. <laughs> At least hard shard was 16%. Okay, this I know. This is nine. This is eight and a half. Oh, not it's even, even nine. less. This is less than like a normal wine. And I just think it's like, it's probably not, there's probably so much freaking sugar in this wine. Probably. It's not even a good grape juice. Nope. I don't know if I want to just keep drinking this or just get a different wine and start over. <laughs> I like I'm... the first sip. It tastes like sparkling grape juice on the first sip. It tastes like... <laughs> It tastes like when I was in eighth grade and it was New Year's Eve. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, and your mom got you sparkling grape juice to toast. <laughs> yes. But then after that, it does not taste good. It tastes like sparkling grape juice gone bad. Yeah. Okay, we don't like it, so we're going to get a new one. So, pause. We're starting over. Yep. All right, so we clearly did not like that first wine. So, we're going to go for attempt number two at a different wine here. And we got a Stella Rosa. Um... Well, Stella Rose is the brand, and this is a Stella Pink, which is a low-alcohol grape wine. Um, There's really not much else on that label. All right. Attempt number two. Okay. Cheers. We have to try things that aren't, like, mega sweet. Well, neither of these were on purpose. (laughs) True. Yeah. It's so... It's, like... Drinking cotton candy. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So it's mega sweet, but better than the other one that we had where it was sweet and then disgusting. Yeah, I think this one, this one definitely is supposed to be this sweet. Like, it's definitely a very strawberry, wildberry sweet. So it is what I expected. Definitely good for, like, a refreshing summer drink, but not good for middle of february so we're definitely striking out for the wine game we're gonna make this bottle work but it is what i wouldn't buy it again yeah um next week we'll have a better wine for sure we promise promise and it's gonna happen but in the meantime let's get started with our story about the wood chipper murderer sounds good so 
Hella Nielsen met her future husband, Richard Crafts, in Miami in 1969. And at the time, she was working as a flight attendant for Pan Am. And Richard was a former Marine, and currently he was a pilot training for Eastern Airlines. She originally grew up and lived in Denmark, but moved to Newtown, Connecticut with Richard after they got married in 1975. Together, they purchased a large house on a two-acre lot, which was plenty of space for the two of them and their three children. In the mid-1980s, Hella could tell that there was something going on with Richard. She had discovered a receipt for a Christmas gift that presumably went to another woman, and their marriage had recently been suffering. Hella hired a private investigator named Keith Mayo, and he confirmed that Richard was indeed having an affair with another woman. Her name was Nancy Dodd, and she happened to be a flight attendant that worked for the same company as Richard, Eastern Airlines. Hella demanded that she and Richard get divorced, but Richard could only think of the financial burden that this would place on him. For the time, in 1986, Richard was making great money. His yearly salary was around $120,000, and he knew a divorce would mean alimony and child support. That is a huge amount of money for that time. I know. That's like, that's a lot of money even currently. Now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let alone 30, 40 years 1986. ago. 1986. We thought that was an absurd amount, so we did an inflation calculator. And his salary in 1986, $120,000, today would be a salary of $283,000. So that's that's, ama- that's almost a $300,000 a year salary. Yeah, that's really freaking good. For just your average Joe, like, that's crazy. <laughs> he could definitely afford a divorce, but he just didn't want to see his money go. I was going to say, the more money you make, the more money you lose. Mm-hmm. A few years prior, Richard had actually been diagnosed with colon cancer and was lucky enough to beat the 2% odds of living with this condition. In an attempt to halt the divorce, he told Hella that his cancer had actually come back, and she was able to tell that he wasn't being honest and went forward with the divorce anyway, which only angered him even more. She hired a divorce lawyer named Diane Anderson and told her, If anything happens to me, it wasn't an accident. You see, Richard had been known for having been physically abusive on some occasion, and Hella started to become quite concerned. Hella had started to develop a strong fear that if she tried to flee from her marriage, Richard, who had once been a pilot on a secret CIA mission, would be able to track her down. On November 18, 1986, a co-worker had dropped Hella off at her home in Newtown, Connecticut, after she returned home from a work trip from Frankfurt, Germany. Not knowing it at the time, but this would be the last time that Hella's friend would ever see her. The next morning, Hella didn't report to work and her friends and co-workers were extremely concerned because they knew she was having marital issues. They contacted Hella's private investigator, Keith, and he agreed it was a good idea to start investigating. Keith asked around, but no one had much to say, except for their nanny. The nanny had told Keith that she recently saw Richard ripping up carpet from his bedroom that had a large dark stain on it. The investigator asked for more information, but the nanny did not have much more than that. When Hella's friends expressed their concerns about her being missing or what might have happened, Richard nonchalantly told them things like, You're watching too many movies. The local police received a tip from a snowplow driver that he had seen a man operating a wood chipper on a bridge over the Housatonic River at night while it was snowing. Odd. This was a tad bit alarming, since none of those conditions are normal to be operating a wood chipper in, so the police went to investigate. The state and local police investigated this tip, and along the shore of the river they found a pile of wood chips, a letter addressed to Hella, and when they searched the river... They found a chainsaw with the serial number filed off, and near it, the serrated blade, which had been taken off the bar of the chainsaw. They also found human hair and tissue between the teeth. At this point, it didn't look great, but there wasn't anything technically connecting the investigation to Hella's disappearance besides that letter. The police obtained a search warrant by late December to search the craft's property. They noticed a few abnormalities right away. For one... There was sections of the carpet that had been removed from the couple's bedroom. 
along with the carpet being gone, there was also a smear of blood along the mattress. Richard told the police that he had no idea about the whereabouts of his wife, but also told some other people about different possibilities about where she might be. One of his stories suggested that she might have gone to Copenhagen, Denmark to care for her ill mother. He also told people that she might have run off to the Canary Islands with a friend, and Richard's defense lawyer would later argue that Hella was a woman who spoke four languages and traveled the world. He suggested that she really could be anywhere. Hella's mother at the time immediately disputed the story that Richard was suggesting. She had stated that her health was well, and Hella was not scheduled for a visit until April of 1997. And while not knowing your wife's whereabouts isn't a true crime in itself, making up numerous stories about where she might be only makes you look a little bit more suspicious. The investigators were meticulously combing through the shoreline, where the snow had been deliberately melted by the investigators, and they were able to uncover more evidence. All the pieces pointed to something, and if involving Hella, would likely point to something sinister. The detectives found two teeth, one tooth crown, which happened to be the most damning evidence at the time, because they could match dental records, but DNA profiling didn't exist yet. They also found one fingernail, bone fragments, over 2,500 strands of blonde hair, and a few drops of blood. While no, technically no body had been located, The evidence they had would be enough to prove that a human body had been mutilated and whoever tragically was involved would not have been able to live through it. They just had to prove, without a body, that it was Hella. Investigators worked to decipher the serial number on the chainsaw found. And wouldn't you know, the number matched the serial number that Richard had filled out on the warranty form. Later, during the trial, the prosecution lawyers used a wood chipper and a frozen pig body to show jurors what bone fragments would look like after a frozen body was pushed through a wood chipper. Through forensic testing, it was found that the blood type found on the carpet of the couple's bedroom actually matched Hella's blood type. And we have to remember that DNA testing was not developed at this point, so taking analysis of the blood type was the best they could do with the technology they had. With all of the evidence they had, the police created a likely scenario of what might have occurred in the Crafts household. They concluded that Richard had bludgeoned Hella to death in their bedroom with a large blunt object, likely a mag light, which was a large police-style flashlight. They suggested that he then froze her body in a large, newly purchased chest freezer. So then, in the middle of the night during a snowstorm, Richard transferred both her frozen body and the wood chipper in a rented U-Haul to a bridge that goes over the river. Richard then used the chainsaw to cut up her body before pushing the pieces through the wood chipper. Before he left, he tried to scratch off the serial number from the chainsaw, dismantled it, and tossed the pieces over the bridge into the river. He had a pretty solid plan, and without an eyewitness, who knows if police would have ever searched the riverbanks and found evidence to link him to Hella's disappearance. Hella and Richard's three children were between the ages of five and ten when Hella went missing. And while the investigation was going on, they moved in with one of Hella's close friends. They wanted to at least attempt to keep some form of normalcy in their overturned lives, and they continued going to school in Newtown. Eventually, in years to come, one of Richard's sisters took custody of the children, and then they moved to Westport, Connecticut. There are reports that the oldest child showed much fear towards their father. Richard was arrested in January of 1987 for the homicide of Hella Crafts and was held on a $750,000 bond at the Bridgeport Community Correctional Center where he stayed, unable to post bond, until his trial in 1987. The trial was off to a fine start. However, one of the jurors ended up walking out of deliberations, causing a mistrial. Richard had a chance at a second trial. And during the entire 11 weeks, Richard maintained his innocence. On November 21st of 1989, Richard Crafts was found guilty of murder. This was a major headlining case for many reasons, but specifically because his was the first case in Connecticut that resulted in a conviction without a body, and it was the first time cameras were allowed in a courtroom during a murder trial. 
Richard was sentenced to 50 years in state prison in 1990. Based on our findings, there were conflicting reports on where he actually served his sentence. One article stated that he began his sentencing in the Bridgeport Community Correction Center and then moved to the Connecticut Corrections Institution in Summers. Another article suggested that he started his sentence off at the MacDougall Walker Correctional Institution, a maximum security facility for men in Suffield, Connecticut. Due to the many conflicting reports, we cannot say with certainty which facility he started or finished his sentence, but we do know it was somewhere in Connecticut. At the time of his sentencing, there was a law in place that has since been changed called the Statutory Good Time, which allowed an inmate to serve significantly less time from their sentence due to good behavior and working jobs within the prison. He wouldn't have been able to get out early if he was sentenced today, but because that's the way the law was written during his sentencing, they have to honor it. Richard tried to appeal his conviction in 1993, citing the evidence used against him was only circumstantial, and also that his case had been so heavily covered in the news that there wasn't a chance for him to have had a fair trial. The state Supreme Court decided to uphold his conviction and not let him out of prison early. Just recently, in January of 2020, a now 82-year-old Richard Crafts was released from the Connecticut prison almost 20 years before the end of his sentence. He was moved into a Halfley House, a veteran's transitional housing program, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he'll stay for a little bit before officially being released. Richard's release conditions do not involve probation, so by summer of 2020, Richard Crafts will officially live among us as a free man. Yeah, he's really something. And it's just crazy, like, we obviously covered this case, like, we had this on our list of cases to cover anyways, but... With the timeliness of it all, we figured this is a pretty good case to bring up right now because he... Yeah, seeing that he was just released and we've seen, like, videos and, like, actual, like, news reports of him being out in public. Yeah, he's like, covered the news here. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's an interesting thing to follow. It is interesting because you don't usually see the release of, like, the perpetrators. You just say, okay, they're going to be serving their time in jail and you never have to deal with the fact of when they're out of jail or... Like, if they'll get out of jail. Like, that's never something to deal with. And really, like, I know he didn't serve his full 50 years, but 50 years is not a long time to murder somebody and send them through a wood chipper. (laughs) Nope. No, it's really not. And Well, and when you really think about it, for the 30 years he did serve, that's really not a long time. No. It's such an interesting case because he he wasn't technically, like, a family annihilator. Like, he didn't snap and kill his family. He, which is, like, what they do, they... Like, he would have killed his children then, but he did not. He just... Went after his <laughs> wife because of a yeah. nasty divorce. He went on a murderous rampage out of, like, anger over divorce. Yeah. Seems like it was a pretty fast time frame to think of that, too. Because, yeah. like, she came home. I mean, maybe he thought of it when she was away. I don't, I don't know. But, like, she came home and then it was just like there we go, she's gone, like, her friends can't find her, like, she's a missing person. Yeah, within a day. Yeah. Yeah, that was fast. He, Super he wasted fast. no time. What else about this case is crazy? I think the craziest thing is just that he's out. Yeah. I like, think 40 the, minutes I, away from us. I know, that's what's crazy. Should we just finish this up here and, and do a little bit of a review on our wine? Yes, but before we do that, I just want to say Richard Crafts, Just because we covered your case, please don't come after us and freeze our bodies and put us through a wood chipper, because that would be really... You'd go to jail again, okay? We aren't the first one to talk about him, I'll tell you that. All right, fair. And we won't be the last. Okay, so back to this end. Okay, so now we're really going to end it. Yeah. All right, so I... Well, the bottle of wine's gone. (laughs) Now, granted, it's 5%. It really tasted like we were drinking a sweet cotton candy berry juice not wine no it wasn't bad again very good for the like summer yeah like at a barbecue or something yeah we made it go down yeah well it was easy to go down it wasn't like we fought this it wasn't gross it just wasn't what it was looking for it was however a hundred times better than the first one we drank oh god that one we dumped out and we were like nah that's not even gonna make it through the podcast so start over yeah yeah it was good um and i don't do not 
recommend drinking taffeta red sparkling fun bubbly bullshit not fun definitely <laughs> bubbly all of the bullshit Ugh, it was gross <laughs> um no but if you're into sweet wine stella rosa is good it's kind of like a spark honestly it's like a sparkling moscato type that's what stella rosa does a lot of like they have a peach one i've had mm. before it's very oh it's like micro bubbly it's so bubbly <laughs> but it's stronger i think than this one is but it, w- it was good I would, yeah i would get it but i i would i just probably won't because i'm just in the mood to try a bunch of wines and i'm not gonna buy it again yeah so yeah but it was good so. yeah before we go since this episode was such a shit show we're gonna provide you with some lovely bloopers from the episode because this one's not a very long one and we figured you guys should be entertained with all of the shenanigans that go on behind the recording so we really hope you enjoy. That's Enough funny. to pat to the to, 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 <laughs> says the the refreshing wine reveals bright pink the refresh <laughs> the refreshing wine reveals bright pink <laughs> fuck. We're just gonna try it. <laughs> okay. We're not even gonna read, we're just gonna pour. <laughs> Clearly we need this wine. So much. Oh, this is a bubble. That is wine notes. <laughs> but also told some <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because <laughs> it sounded stupid. <laughs> All the pieces pointed to something. An if involving Hella <laughs> <laughs> What? <laughs> well I was gonna hell, just say huh? <laughs> I was just gonna say hell. <laughs> That's funny. Said that he started his sentence off in MacDougal. <laughs> walker okay i think i because i keep seeing mac and i just take the a out yep oh perfect (laughs) (laughs) started his sentence off at the mac (laughs) do mick suggested that he started his sentence off at the (laughs) sorry i couldn't then i was laughing Started his sentence off at the McDougal Walker. Con- <laughs> I'm sorry. I I was trying to hold back a laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did that he started his sentence off at the McDougal Walker Correctional Institution. <laughs> Another article suggested that he started his sentence off at the McDougal Walker Correctional Institution, a maximum security facility for men in Suffield, Connecticut. That was a hard emphasis on maximum. <laughs> That's okay. I'm saying it one more time. Oh, okay. ...suggested that he started his sentence off at the McDougal Walker (laughs) Correctional Institution. ...started his sentence off at the McDougal Walker Correctional Institution. A maximum security... (laughs) Fuck me! (laughs) You're gonna laugh, I feel it. (laughs) What was that? (laughs) I'm nervous. You're like, you're right! (laughs) Another article suggested that he started his sentence off at the McDougal Walker <laughs> Correctional Institution. Okay. Why? <laughs> Another article. <laughs> that was you. I know. <laughs> he started his sentence off at the McDougal Walker Correctional Institution, a maximum security facility for men in Suffield, <laughs> Connecticut. <laughs> suggested that he started his sentence off at the McDougal Walker Correctional Institution, a maximum security <laughs> facility. Oh, okay. shit. Okay. All right, we're getting through it. Okay. Okay, no, we're... No, we're not. <laughs> oh, no. article suggested that he started his sentence off at the MacDougal Walker Correction. <laughs> what is that? Because that one I felt a little... It was aggressive. Yes. Just recently in... Ni- 19. <laughs> Just recently, in January of 19... 19- why do I keep saying 19? <laughs> had bludgeoned Hella to death and... I, like, didn't... <laughs> that Richard had bludgeoned Hella to death in their be- bedroom. <laughs> that Richard had bludgeoned... Why can't I say that word? I don't know. Very vulgar when we fuck up. How, like... I don't know. I guess I just never really realized that you... It, you can't even get one sentence... The first sentence <laughs> right. I That's- wish... There- Thank you so much for listening this week. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Chilled and Killed Podcast or send us an email with any questions, comments, or requests at chilledandkilledpodcast at gmail.com. 
And we'll be back next time to talk about Elisa Lamb. Until next time. Bye. bye.